The thing I love about movies is the peace of mind knowing that I don't have to be perfect the first time. I can be perfect the second time or the third time. You need to be perfect here the first time. Yes, I know that. Now, I'm writing a book, and I didn't want to write the book, but I felt like I had to write the book. Did you feel the same way about the books you've written? I wrote a book because I wanted to talk about my search for art an actor, being an actor, what is acting, what is the best kind of acting, and my search for love. The first book, Kiss Me Like a Stranger, and I didn't know how to structure it until I found one day writing, scribbling really, noodling, uh, all the ironies in my life, like being miscast in Mother Courage by Jerome Robbins, and knowing I was miscast, but Anne Bancroft's boyfriend was Mel Brooks. And that's when I met him, which changed my life. Exactly. Yeah. You met Mel? Backstage. In the miscast production of Mother Courage? Yeah. Yeah, I did. Well, the shows got... I was miscast in, they didn't lead to anything good. Well, I knew of Mel Brooks, and I'd never met him. And so I was a little nervous, and, uh... I went back to Anne Bancroft's dressing room after the performance at the Martin Beck Theater, and I saw Mel there with uh, a pea jacket, beautiful merchant marine black jacket, and, and he looked strikingly handsome, almost. And uh, I said, hello, hello, my goodness, you look so good in that jacket, uh, Mel. And Mel said, yeah, well, they used to call them urine jackets, but they didn't sell, so they changed it to a pea jacket. I laughed, his wife laughed, and that's how we met. What year was that? Mm, you recall? 63. And how soon after that did you work with him? Um, Mel invited me to come to Fire Island to have dinner with Annie and him, and... Uh, and you hadn't worked with him at that point? No, I hadn't, but he liked what I was doing in the play, and... Uh, he said, I want to read the first 30 pages of this movie I'm writing called Springtime for Hitler. He read, after dinner, he read the first 30 pages. And then he said, uh, would you like to play Leo Bloom? I said, sure, I would. He said, well, all right. In the fall, don't you take anything without calling me first. So I said, okay, I promise. And in September, I was offered One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest on Broadway with Kirk Douglas. And I called Mel, I said, I feel a little silly. But you said, uh, yeah, 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 that's okay. Can you get a two week out in your contract? I said, they'll never, I'm not a star. They're not gonna give me that. And um, he said, can you get a, a four week out? I said, probably. He said, all right, we'll have to live with it. Three years went by. I never heard from him. I didn't get a telegram. I didn't get a telephone call. I didn't get a letter. And one day I was doing a play called Love by Murray Shiskal. And I was taking off my makeup backstage, knock, knock on the door. I opened the door, and there's Mel with a tall gentleman behind him. And I said, Mel, he said, you don't think I forgot, do you? <laughs> and um, he said, this is our producer, Sidney Glazier, and we're ready to do Springtime for Hitler. Uh, we have the money now. The only thing is, you have to meet Zero Mostel because he has rights over who can play the part of Leo Blue. Approval. How does one win zero still? I'm going to tell you. I went in there and Mel opened the door and he said, uh, Gene, this is Z. I saw zero standing in the background. I said, Z, this is Gene. And I put out my hand shyly, nicely. And zero grabbed my hand and pulled me up and kissed me on the lips. And I thought at first he's trying to make a joke. And I thought, no. He knows too much about actors and acting. He wants me to relax, because I had to do a reading with him. And it worked. All the nervousness flew out. I did a reading, uh, and I got the part. How long did the producers take to shoot? Eight weeks. You shot the movie in eight weeks? Mm -hmm. And it cost $947,000. Was it everything very efficient? Did you do a lot of takes? Did you, could you luxuriate? No, we didn't do a lot of takes. No. You no. had to be on. The big scene where I go nuts, hysterical, right. you know, that scene, 
um, we just at the end of the day, and uh, he said, let's go through that once. And I, I did the scene with Zero. Everyone laughed. They were applauding afterwards. And I was getting hoarse from doing it. I'm hysterical. I'm wet. I thought, now I can go home and rest, and we'll do this tomorrow morning. He said, no, no, not tomorrow morning. Now, tonight. I said, you didn't tell me it was for today. He said, yeah, yeah, we have to do it tonight. I said, but, what, but my throat, my voice, my... He said, what can I get you? I remembered my fencing days at the Bristol Old Vic Theatre School. And when I was doing a match, the fencing master would say, grab some sugar uh, and put it in your mouth and get quick energy. So I said, get me some Hershey bars, Mel. He says, with nuts or without? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, no nuts, because it might get caught in my throat. So they came back up. I ate two Hershey bars, and then we did the scene. This wasn't your first movie. I had a very small part, a very good but small part in Bonnie and Clyde. Right. But before it even came out, we did The Producers. So The Producers was my second movie. By the way, they changed the title from Springtime for Hitler to, to The, the producers, producers. Wisely. Because Joe Levine thought it would offend the Jews in the Midwest. And then Peter Sellers called Joe Levine up. I'm saying Joe Levine out of respect, because I could call him something else. Um, and Peter Sellers said, this is the best movie uh, comedy I've seen in 20 years. Why did you change the title? So they called, Joe Levine called Mel and uh, said, you want to change the title back to Springtime for Hitler? And Mel said, Joe, we open in Philadelphia next week. The posters are up. The ads are out. I, it's too late. And so, um, so it became the producers. Was the movie successful when it came out? No, no, because it didn't get the New York Times review. But that mattered back then. Well, to Joe Levine it did, because he was doing The Graduate, and uh, he wanted more money for... This is speculation on my part, but good speculation. I think he wanted more money to put into The Graduate. And when it didn't get The New York Times, he, he, sold, it to, it. he sold it to the movie, to uh, network television. Why do you think the film went on to become so loved by people? Because it was a very good, unique picture, and the word got around, and then Mel got nominated for Best Writer. I got nominated for Best Supporting Actor. And he won. I was saying, oh, I hope I don't win because I'm too nervous to get up and make a speech. And then Mel said, it's a little immodest, but I'll say it anyway. Mel said when he accepted his award, and I want to thank Gene Wilder and Gene Wilder and Gene Wilder. And people applauded, and I cried, and that was it. What was the movie you made right after the producers? Start the Revolution Without Me. Donald Sutherland and a, a, a very good English cast. Uh, Orson Welles was the narrator in it. That came out too soon. It came out in 1968. And uh, two years later, I think it would have been a big success. But at the time, people wanted social reality stories and not about comedies and farces of the French Revolution. One of the things when I think of the producers, I think of a line in the most well-known and the most successful films you've done is that you play the timid man, the gentle man, the small man. Brooks said that you were the perfect victim when you worked yes. in the producers. Yeah. I'm sorry. I don't like people touching my blue blanket. It's not important. It's a minor compulsion. I can deal with it if I want to. It's just that I've had it ever since I was a baby, and I find it very comforting. And then you've done other films where you play the larger-than-life man and the yes. very confident man. Yes. And that disposition, which I'm also pretty obsessed with when I, when I work on a piece, I think to myself, how does this person think that they fit into the world? Are they in charge and they're calling all the shots, or are they at the beck and call of other people, perhaps? When you do Willy Wonka, the character has, I mean, here you are, someone who up till then 
had played these, uh, you know, these gentle people. Yes. And then you play Willy Wonka, where you think, obviously, it would tilt toward being a gentle person dealing with these kids and helping them. But you didn't play it as a gentle no, person. No, 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 no. Whose idea was that? Well, it was my idea to play it that way because I thought this is a morality movie, and I should scare the shit out of these kids. Because it's for a purpose, to find who's going to take over for me. And I had to be cruel in order to give my whole chocolate factory to this <laughs> young boy. To someone worthy. And I, I got very cruel, yelling rage in the second last scene. And then Charlie is so honest that he gives me back the everlasting gobstopper. Mr. Wonka? Charlie turns to go, and you have that line, which is... So shines a good deed in a weary world. Charlie! It was your idea to make him... Yes, uh, well, uh, uh, the stick. That was the, the biggest idea I had, because he, the story started, and he was just Willy Wonka coming out and saying hello to people. When I was asked to do it by... Uh, the director, I said, I'll do it if I can come out with a cane, limping, the first time the audience sees me, and then hobble my way up to the gate where the kids are, and my cane gets stuck into a cobblestone, and I keep on walking until I realize that I don't have it, and I do a forward somersault and leap up, and then they all applaud. Right. He said, why do you want to do that? And I said, because from that point on, no one will know whether I'm telling the truth or lying. And, I, and he said, you mean you won't do the film if you can't do that? I said, that's right. And so we did it. Before you had done Wonka, had you ever done any musicals before? Because the movie, to a degree, is a musical. No, I hadn't. The um, theater? Well, we all sang in Mother Courage, but that wasn't me alone. That was the whole cast. Willy Wonka was the first one that I sang in. I had taken singing lessons, though. With who and where? The Ansonia Hotel on the west side. <laughs> of course. <laughs> and her name was Betty, I think Betty Walker. I was getting hoarse from doing the play Love on Broadway, eight performances a week, and someone advised me to take singing lessons to learn how to breathe. And then I didn't have any trouble, and haven't had since then. I think every performer in a line, from like Mickey Rooney to you to Hugh Jackman, has learned to sing at the Ansonia Hotel, don't you think? <laughs> but when you did it, did you have fear of it? Were you intimidated about singing? I have terrible fear of singing. People always ask me, why don't you sing? Not in the movies I did. No, no, no. On really? stage, I would have. If I had to do a solo on stage, I would be... Nervous. Why? What's the difference for you? Well, Why because... do you feel safer on a movie set than on stage? I always feel safer on a movie set. Always. I'm the opposite. Because they can't get you. If you're doing a movie, they can't come and get you. You know? Yeah. You're safe. And I then... feel more at home on stage than I do on a sound stage. Not that I dislike being on a sound stage, but I feel more at home and more relaxed in front of an audience. Because I think to myself, well, they all came to see me. I literally have this little trick I play on myself where I walk out on stage and I say, well now, <laughs> thank you all for coming. Well, I like being on stage. I liked it a lot at times. Um, but when I did Bonnie and Clyde and then the producers and then started doing the movies, I felt a freedom that I didn't have on stage because I like to do things spontaneously. If you do something in a movie and you do another take, you can try something different. And then you can try something different on the third take, depending on who's the director and what the movie is and so on. In a play, you want to relive the part as if it were for the first time. But of course, you have to stick to certain rules. You can't change the dialogue and you can't change the staging. I just feel more comfortable. It's almost a kind of religious feeling I have that if there were a God in heaven, it's just between her and me, and 40 people on the crew, but right. it's basically her and me, or him and me, or it and me. Right. And I feel safe, alone, alone in public, which was 
Right. Shut us off. Private in public. Yeah. You worked with someone in your early career who also was very effective at doing the same thing, which was Lee J. Cobb. Cobb could play the big man, and Cobb could play the man that was stooped over by life, you know. What was it like when you worked with him? I saw Lee J. Cobb and Mildred Dunnick in Death of a Salesman when I was just turned 16. I was doing summer stock in Poughkeepsie, just outside of Poughkeepsie, New York. And I went with my sister, Corrine, and we saw him, Lee J. Cobb, and waited for him afterwards, because my sister wanted an autograph. And that changed my life, because I didn't want to be a comedian anymore. I used to think I did. I wanted to be an actor, a comic actor, maybe, but an actor. And I started studying. Fourteen years later, I played Bernard, the snot-nosed kid from next door, in the CBS television two-hour drama of Death of a Salesman, starring Lee J. Cobb and Mildred Dunnick. Where are you? You're supposed to study with me today. Bernard, look at Bernard. What are you looking so anemic about? Come on, Let's Bernard. Let's okay. 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 <laughs> Biff, I heard Mr. Birnbaum say that if you don't start studying math, he's going to flunk you and you won't graduate. Pop, you didn't see my sneakers. Hey! Just because he printed University of Virginia on his sneakers doesn't mean they have to graduate him. What are you talking about? With three universities offering him scholarships, they're going to flunk him? What are you such a pest? Don't be... What an anemic. Okay. <laughs> I'm waiting for you in my house, Biff. <laughs> <laughs> it was a great thrill for me, and... And he was wonderful. I, I loved him in it. I loved her. I was very close with Mildred Dunnick. And when the, those films that came your way, the films you chose to do after you'd done The Producers, you've been nominated. I'm assuming that you had a lot of opportunities, yes? Yeah. But and the films you chose, why did you want to do Quackster Fortune? Quackster Fortune has a cousin in, in the, the Bronx. Because I read it and cried and thought, uh, this is the kind of movie I would like to make. It was a good, it was a good film, it was a sweet film, and I was happy I made it. I played an Irishman and uh, lived outside of Dublin for four months. And I loved it there until October came, and then I could see why uh, so many Irish people drank a lot. <laughs> Start the Revolution Without Me, Cracks of Fortune, and Willy Wonka were not commercial successes, not one of them. Nor the producers. And I thought, well, I don't know if I'll ever work again. But your first movie is Bonnie and Clyde. Mm -hmm. Did something happen to you when you were shooting Bonnie and Clyde? Did something click for you when you said to yourself, I really like this? This I really I read the, the script and I said, I don't understand why they're making this film. Who's directing it? And my agent, Lily Veit, the widow of Conrad Veit, the German actor, said, Arthur Penn. I said, oh, well, that's different. He'll provide the point of view. And so I said, yes. And the thing that happened was I looked at the lines and I said, these, some of these lines are a little dopey because I, I saw humor in it, but not in the lines that they had given me. And so I changed some lines and no one said anything about it. Your grand host, bud. Maybe all will join up with us. <laughs> Oh, oh, boy, you sure would be surprised to hear that back home. What, what would Bill and Martin say if they heard that? Lordy, they would have a fit. Hey, what do you do anyhow? I'm an undertaker. Get them out of here. Arthur Penn said to me later, I never th imagined the part being played the way you played it. I said, uh... Well, why did you hire me? He said, well, I saw you in a play on Broadway. And then I said to Warren Beatty, something the same. And he, I said, well, why did you? He said, because I saw you in a play on Broadway. <laughs> Were it only so today that those people would see plays on Broadway and yeah. cast people from that? I wish. I wish. Friends, producers, and directors said, why don't you go to California, go to Hollywood? you have a face that would light up on the screen. And I said, because I'll go to California and I'll sit in front of some producer with a big cigar and he'll say, I hear you're a very funny guy. That would sink me. But 
if I'm on stage and I'm funny, and they say, I want that guy to be in the movie, because he's really funny. I don't have to prove myself about being funny. But when you did, that was your first movie. You felt this yeah. was for you. I did. And I knew I was going to be doing The Producers with Mel. Then I started to really like the movies after The Producers. So after you did Wonka, you did? Everything you always wanted to know about sex but were afraid to ask. Woody Allen found out that I was in Milwaukee. I don't know how he knew. And he called me up. And he said, I want to, I want to do a remake of Sister Carrie. And I want to use either you or Laurence Olivier. But instead of Jennifer Jones, I want to use a sheep. I knew right away what he wanted. He wanted someone who could fall in love with a sheep and play it straight. That was really something. I never thought it could be like this. Never in my wildest imagination. <laughs> You're really something special. I love our L-shaped room. I'll never forget these afternoons we've had. I don't think I've ever known such peace and happiness in my life. I hope you feel the same way. <laughs> then came... Young Frankenstein. Yes, Young Frankenstein. I have a boundless admiration for people who play and commit to the unhinged genius. So when you do Young Frankenstein, you play someone who is nuts. You know, who really goes yeah. nuts. Yeah. I have to tell you, apropos of what you're saying, that it sort of goes along with where I was psychologically in my life. Because I, I was a very mixed up fellow when I was a young man. And uh, I needed help and I went to a therapist for seven and a half years. Within that time, I was changing from the sheep that Mel talks about into the wild man, well, that that Dr. Frankenstein was. Still a little sheep in there, but com when it comes out, it comes out in a burst of madness when Dr. Frankenstein is going nuts. This is a nice boy. This is a good boy. This is a mother's angel. And I want the world to know once and for all, and without any shame, that we love him. <laughs> oh. I'm going to teach you. I'm going to show you how to walk, how to speak, how to move, how to think. Together, you and I are going to make the greatest single contribution to science since the creation of fire. Dr. Frankenstein, are you all right? My name is Frankenstein. What was coming out of you? Rage, rage at my first wife. We'll have to talk about that one day. Let me get a pen. <laughs> Um, I was meek, timid, shy, gentle. I was all of those things that Mel saw in me, and that's why I was right for the producers. But I didn't want to stay that way. Right. And then as I grew healthier, I called on things in my life that allowed me to play things like Dr. Frankenstein. Which you wrote. Yes, and Mel supervised the writing. Had you been writing it for quite a while? Or no, you I sat down and wrote, write it after you finished with Alan? I had written one screenplay called Hesitation Waltz. It wasn't any good. I wrote a second one called Tough Guy. Better, but wasn't any good. And the third one, I was noodling after I saw Marty Feldman in the Marty Feldman comedy machine. And I thought he would be wonderful in the story about Frankenstein. And, and I got a call asking if I would do a film with Peter Boyle and Marty Feldman and myself. I said, why do you mention that? He said, because I now represent you and Peter and Marty. I said, well, I think I do have something. 
because I only had two pages, I think. And he said, send it to me. And I said, um, no, give me another day or two. I, I want to do a little more writing. And I wrote the Transylvania station scene, almost verbatim, the way it is in the movie. And then I sent it off, and Columbia bought it, and they wanted to do it for $1,750,000, and Mel said, our budget is two. And then Michael Gruskoff gave it to his friend, Alan Laird, Jr., and we did it for $3 million. Mel said, you think you're pretty smart that your first draft was uh, accepted by Columbia. I said, yeah, pretty smart. He said, well, I got news for you. Now the work begins. And now the, then the work did begin because we did a second draft, third draft, and fourth draft. If my draft had been made, it would have been a failure. I wrote every day. Mel would come in because I think he was preparing Blazing Saddles at the time, and he would look at what I wrote, no, 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 yes, yes, no, 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 yes, yeah, no. All right, now, we got to have a villain. You don't have a villain. You have a burgermeister. That's not a villain. And I said, what about the guy Lionel Atwell stuck darts into his wooden arm in The Bride of Frankenstein? Said, yeah. So I would spend the next day writing that. Yeah, 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 okay. And then he'd go on to the next thing. What is that wonderful actor's name who played the Spectre Captain? Kenny Mars. He was so funny. <laughs> he, he made us laugh so... And ironically, I mean, actors are... Most of us, not you or me, but most of us are a little crazy. And when Kenny saw the finished product, he came to me and then to Mel and said, please, let me revoice the whole thing, my whole part. Because that, that's crazy what I'm doing there. It, uh, and Mel said, yeah, yeah, well, we'll see. We'll see. So, and we both looked at each other when Kenny left. It's perfect the way it is. Yeah. I don't know. He thought something was wrong with his German accent, I think. And it was wonderful because he, it was crazy. Is he one of those people for you? Because for me, I see things, you work with people, and I appreciate them. But much of what I see, it's more amusing or cute than really funny. Was he one of those people who, because I've had a handful of these in my life, that they really got to me. I couldn't control myself. Kenny Mars? Kenny oh, Mars. yeah. Kenny Mars and Cloris Leachman. And Cloris Leachman. You couldn't keep a straight face. Oh, my God. I had such a hard time with her. Who cast that film? Mel. Did Mel cast yeah, his own film? Sure. He found all those people? Yes. Tell me about Madeline. I think she's one of the, the three greatest actresses I've ever come across and certainly worked with. She could do anything. She could be so funny that you would break up laughing, and she could sing a song that would melt your heart, opera or just a ballad, and she could do a drama. She could do anything. She was just filled with talent. Oh, dear. Well, I guess this is it. Freddie, darling, well, how can I say in a few minutes what it's taken me a lifetime to understand? Won't you try? All right. You got it, mister. I'm yours, all of me. What else can I say? My sweet love. The hair, the hair. Just from set. Sorry, sorry. I hope you like old-fashioned weddings. I prefer old-fashioned wedding night. Oh, you're incorrigible. She had the humanity inside the insanity, mm. which I love. Mm. People the... who are nutty, but at the same time, they're human. Yes, her... she was definitely a part of her was a little nutty. Me too. Yes. Um, but a part of her was so dramatic, sincere, emotional. One time I, when we were filming in Sherlock Holmes' Smarter Brother, I was directing and I wanted her to be very emotional at a certain point. She was lying and lying and lying and I said, instead of come in, Miss Liar, I said, come in, Miss Whore. <laughs> Tears coming down. She carried on. She did the scene, but the tears were coming down her cheeks. She was brilliant. She knew that I was trying some Ilya Kazan trick. You never worked with Kazan, did you? No, but he got me into the actor's studio. Did you have some regular sessions there? Yeah, every, every week for about four and a half years. You studied with Hagen? I studied with Uta Hagen and Herbert Berghoff. And then I was so mixed up about what acting is Units, objectives, actions. I talked to my friend Charles Grodin. He was studying with Strasberg. 
I said, what does Strasbourg say about units and objectives, actions, conditions? He said, I've been there for a long time. I've never heard him mention those things. <laughs> those things. I said, well, that's the, that's the man for me. And, and I went to see Strasbourg, and I, I got into his private classes, and then I auditioned. And there was um, Lee Strasberg, Ilya Kazan, and the lady producer. Cheryl Crawford? Yeah, Cheryl Crawford. You had to get two out of three votes. And after I got in, I snuck into the secretary's desk to look to see who voted for me. Why did you do that? I wanted to know whether Strasberg did or didn't. Why? Because what if you found that he didn't? What would it have done to you? He didn't. He didn't? No, but Kazan did. And what did you do? What, how did that paint your attitude towards Strasbourg thereafter? Uh, did you spit on the ground whenever no, you saw him? No, I said, thank goodness for Kazan. When you do the research about Strasbourg and all of method acting, almost at the very end, like a code, it says, now, don't use any of this stuff unless you need to. Right. Did you find that your own imagination took you there, or did you have to have a technique for acting? Usually my own imagination, That's usually. What I thought. But if I got stuck and I needed some help, technical help, I would use a sense memory, an image of something that would set me off. <laughs> My first wife, for instance. <laughs> ha! I'll have to try that. Yeah. Were well, your parents know. actors? No, my mother played the piano. My father made miniature beer and whiskey glasses out of rosin, melted down. No, he was not an actor. What did he think of what you were doing? He always used to say to me when I was growing up, I know you want to act. I know you're wonderful. You're a natural. But don't put all your eggs in one basket. <laughs> Sound familiar? Oh. Don't put all your eggs in one basket. And afterwards, when he saw a limousine come to pick me up in Milwaukee to take me to Chicago with him to be interviewed and do publicity for Willy Wonka, on the ride home, he was very quiet, and he, he took my hand and like this, and he said, it's a good thing you put all your eggs in one basket. I was so pleased that he, that he lived to be able to say that to me. I was very touched by it. My dad, you want to know the one piece of advice he gave me? What? I fell in love my freshman year of college, and it was the first time I really think I fell in love deeply with a woman. And I came home and I started asking my dad about what it was like to be in love and uh, what it meant to when he met my mother and you know, what really happens between a man and a woman in an adult relationship emotionally. And all of a sudden the conversation led to this point where I knew it was coming. Here we had arrived at the moment when my dad was going to give me his piece of advice to me about sex and love and marriage and all of those things. And my dad, who had six children, was a public school teacher and had no money. He had holes in his shoes. He had nothing for himself. That is what I think fueled his advice. My dad said to me, let me tell you one thing. If you meet two women and you love them both very much and one of them has a lot of money, you'll know what to do. And that was the only advice my dad ever gave me. Mm, well, I can see where he was coming from. <laughs> At some point, when you made films, you decided to direct films. Mm. When did you cross that line? Which is a big line to cross, in my opinion. Mm. Because of Young Frankenstein and seeing Marty Feldman and working with Madeleine Kahn, I started writing um, Sherlock Holmes' Smarter Brother. I was in the editing room with Mel all the time, and he said one time when it, there wasn't a close-up of Terry Garr, he got up and started hitting his head against the wall three times. Bam! Bam! I, I was worried he was going to really hurt himself. Bam! And then he said, all right, let's not get excited. <laughs> he said, ladies and gentlemen, you've just seen a 14-minute failure, rotten sequence. In a week, you're going to see a fairly rotten sequence. In another week, you're going to see a fairly good sequence. In another week, he said, you're going to see a masterpiece. But I left out a close-up of Terry Garr. I, she wasn't in that part of the scene, and I need one. I, I, I think he's, he let her go earlier or something like that. 
He said, don't you ever make this mistake when you're directing. He said to me. I said, when am I directing? Yeah, yeah, you'll see. Once you start writing, you're going to want to protect what you've written. And then you're going to want to direct it. And either it'll make a little money and they'll let you do it again, or it'll flop and they'll never let you do it again. Warren Beatty, of all people, had said that to me once, because I directed a film, and Beatty said to me, uh, you know, eventually you're going to get to the point, you're going to make movies, and you're going to realize that uh, unless you're going to take the ultimate responsibility yes, yes. and step up and direct, you, 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 you have no right to complain. You know, you have to really, eventually it's going to drive you nuts, and you're going to want to get up there and do it yourself. And I found that for me, in my case, of this film I directed, that my performance was the one that suffered the most. That's the problem. Right. That's the whole problem. I had a monitor. After each take, I could go and look and say, no, the, in the middle stinks. The, fir the first part is okay. The end could use a little rewriting or a restaging of the middle or, or whatever it is. But still, the performance of the uh, actor-director is always going to suffer in a way that it doesn't suffer if you have a good director and you're just acting. Right. I'd rather direct the sure. film and not, I, or have I a modest role. I understand that. Something very simple. Yeah. And I, I, this, this speaks to what you said about Mel. I'd be in the editing room, and there's my assistant director with the camera report in her lap in a big binder, and we're watching the downloaded dailies. And I said to her, uh, show me the close-up of so-and-so. Uh, and, -so. and she said, well, we don't have it. Mm -hmm. Like, all of a sudden, I became the producer, mm -hmm. speaking to myself in the other chair, saying, you, you mean to say you don't have a close-up of the girl? At that moment, the critical moment in the piece? And I thought, I didn't shoot this. this. Did you find the same was true for you? Yes, well, you reminded me of something in Young Frankenstein. After the charades game, I go up to Marty Feldman. Are you trying to tell me? And the rest of it. And, but it would be like that if I had left out not covering with a close-up of something that was essential and you don't realize it till the next day, and you've, that set has already been torn down. It's so aggravating, but it happens. It does happen, that's how we learn. To this day, I mean, I've made 40 films, and to this day I go to work and I'll say to, they'll say to me, uh, we're gonna put a 40 on here and change this lens, and, we're gonna do, and I'll sit there and go, I have no idea what, what this lens does or that. I don't even care anymore. Mm. And, and what the cutting point is, and we're gonna cross the line, and I gotta cheat the camera over here. I have no interest in that. But you directed five films. Mm -hmm. So after you directed your first film, what was the next one you directed? The World's Greatest Lover. With, uh, with uh, Carol with Kane. Carol Kane. Right? Mm -hmm. Why don't you still write and direct now? Well, I don't want to act in movies anymore unless there's something just wonderful comes along because I don't want to act in junk. And directing... I've only directed what I've written and acted in, and I don't want to just go out and direct for directing's sake. I don't love it. And I, I realize at a certain point, I'm a good director, but I'll never be a very good director. I can be a very good actor, but I can't be a very good director. That's just Why? A, Why? Because I'm a good boy, and I try to come in on budget, maybe five days over of a, a big film, but to take the time... You're not selfish enough. To be a good director. Yes, that's right. Not selfish enough. Yeah. And, I, and you have to be. You have to be. If Stanley Kubrick brings the cast together and gets his first shot at 4 o'clock in the afternoon after working with them, rehearsing, trying things, and then say, okay, right, let's shoot, and then does one or two shots, you know, but he can do it. He, he could have done it. Kazan did it, too. He didn't say, here's what we're going to do. First shot is this, second shot is this, third shot is this. Sidney Lumet would rehearse for two weeks, get all the staging with the cameraman there watching, and then they'd go and shoot it, and they could do it in a short time. Yeah. yeah. Like Hitchcock. Yeah, but I, I, I didn't think I could do that. In some films you play, as I said to you, the gentleman, and in another film you play, the strong-willed man, the unhinged genius. But in Blazing Saddles, you don't play either. <laughs> There's a kind of this weird, zenned out quality. Talk about that film and how you came upon the choices you made. Well, Mel came to me with the script, which was called Black Bart at the time. He said he wanted me to play Harvey Corman's part. Now, this is after the producers and everything, and we were very close. And I said, but I'm, I'm not right for that. 
He said, I, I said, now, the Waco kid, yes, maybe. He said, no, 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 I, no, I need an over-the-hill alcoholic. Uh, I've got Dan Daly who's going to come and do it. I need an older guy. Not. To, and then he calls me four or five weeks later, and he said, Dan Daly begged off, and I got Gig Young. And Gig Young came to the studio to shoot. He got into his costume, got his makeup. We're walking to the jail cell, and he starts foaming at the mouth. Mel thought it was method acting. Good, keep doing what you're doing, Gig. <laughs> you know, until Great I, stuff, Gig. Until I realized that the man was having withdrawal from alcohol, and he needed an ambulance. They called the ambulance, Mel, he went to a payphone on the soundstage, and he called me, can you come here now and do the Waco kid? I said, what, ha I'll tell you later, can you do, I said, well, I'm, I'm leaving to go uh, to, to London to do the Little Prince with Stanley Donnan. Call him up, say, can you get out, can you do it, switch it around, can you, so I called Stanley, and I told him, and he said, do you want to do it? I said, well, I, 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 I don't want to disappoint Mel, that's all. Um, he said, all right, I'll put you at the end of the schedule instead of at the beginning. And I was on a plane the next day, and I was upside down in the jail cell the day after. A man drink like that, and he don't eat. He is going to die. When? What's your name? Well, my name is Jim, but most people call me... Jim. <laughs> okay, Jim. Since you are my guest and I am your host, what are your pleasures? What do you like to do? Oh, I don't know. Play chess. Screw. Well, let's play chess. And then it turned out to be really wonderful. I don't, not my acting, but the whole movie is unique. It was um, surrealistic, I it's thought. Nuts. Yeah. And I enjoyed it a lot. Have you, have you fallen in love with women you've worked with? Because there is that danger, in my estimation. There is. There's, there's falling in lust. Well, there's always there's that. There's falling in life. That's with checkout girls yeah, at the grocery store, yeah. quite frankly. But. but falling in love, that's a different thing. But spending time around someone and that kind of instant familiarity that people have, you know each other from the work you've done, and then you meet them in the flesh, and you've admired them, and so forth. And everybody comes together, and they spend these long, arduous days, and they're working on something so intimate uh, normally, uh, and you really have this special kind of uh, uh, ambiance there. And I really mean falling in love. Have you ever fallen in love with someone you worked with? No. You know, you can be infatuated with someone, right. but I don't call that falling in love. Right. So you've been I, don't, I don't mean falling in lust now. I mean infatuated. Right. And were you infatuated with people? Yes, once I was, but it didn't work out. It didn't amount to anything? Okay. No. I've only been in love in that respect. Well, you could say about Gilda that... Say you, it about Gilda. Yeah. Um, Where did you meet her? That's um, where I'm headed here, actually. Oh, oh uh, it's funny. I had a funny feeling that you might be. Was I that obvious? No, you weren't. Thank you. No, but I'm that intuitive. But uh, anyway, I met her on a film that I thought would be good, but it wasn't good. It was called Hanky Panky. And then Gilda and I went together after the film uh, and then got married. And then she got cancer and then she died. You knew her how long before you married her? Two years. She was done with SNL by then. She yes, she was all done. She was yeah, done. Yeah. She wanted to get married, and she was so dependent, and, and she said, well, why can't we get married? And I'd say, it's not that I don't love you, it's just that I don't want your arms around my neck, but you're, you're choking me, because it has nothing to do with love. It's, I don't want you to be dependent on me, I want you to be independent, and we could love each other, and, and you can be you, and I can be me, and then we can be us together. And one time, we were going to France together for my birthday. We had a little dog, then her dog, um, Sparkle. And in the airport, in the waiting room that they gave us, to, uh, the dog started sniffing around a box. And, and she said, what, what's he eating? And I looked over, and it was rat poison. I said, but he didn't eat it. He's just sniffing at it. He wouldn't eat that. 
He said, I'm not going to take a chance. And she grabbed the dog and said, you go ahead, go on to France. Um, I know you love me and, and, uh, and I love you and it's your birthday and you're so tired and you go to France and I'm going to stay here. And she took that dog to uh, a vet. He induced the vomiting for the dog and it was rat poison the dog ate. When I got to France and I thought, if she can say that to me, I know you love me, you know I love you, go off and have a nice time. I, I was waiting to hear that for two years. And I never heard it. And this time I heard it because of a dog who almost died from eating rat poison. And when I came back, I proposed to her. And we so got you married. meet Mel Brooks because you're cast in Mother Courage. That's right. It's always kind of a bank shot for That's you. That's why I was saying I you started writing because of irony. Because the dog eats yeah, the rat poison. because the dog ate rat poison. It's amazing. It all That's right. comes together. Yeah. <laughs> Do you think that what you have now, because it seems like what you have now is pretty special, you're telling me. Do you think that what you have now, this is perfection for you? This is what you've been after? This is what I was searching for. This is what you were looking for? All my life. A home with someone. My wife, Karen, and I, we've been married 15 years now. Right. We had lived together for one year before that. So I met her in the strangest way, sort of to do with what we're talking about. I was offered a film called See No Evil, Hear No Evil. Now I've got to find out about the deaf and the blind. I went to the Braille Institute in LA and I went to the New York League for the Hard of Hearing and I met a Ms. Webb. I thought, oh God, I'm gonna meet some old New England biddy. Uh, say, you're making fun of the... Well, out walks this vision in a lavender with a little pink and blue splattered into the skirt and she put me through uh, all kinds of tests to see what I could read from reading lips. Um, you wanted to read her lips. I, well, yes. Yes. But she said, um, I'm trying to get money for a grant to make videotapes for people who are losing their hearing all over the country to send to libraries. If I ever get the money, would you help me? And I said, sure, I will. And, uh, oh, must have been almost a year later, she called and said, I've got the money, will you help? And I said, uh, yeah, I will. Send me what have you got. So we met at a little restaurant that's my favorite, our favorite now. And she brought a tape recorder and she had all these ideas about what would happen if a person was chewing gum and you're trying to read their lips. What would happen if they were in a shadow and you're trying to read their lips? What if they were drinking soup and they're trying? And I improvised. And then she typed it up and we met again a week later, put the tape recorder on the table. Same thing, again, improvise, improvise. The third time, I said, leave the recorder at home. It's like, put the candle, candle back. back. <laughs> leave uh, the recorder at home. And that was our first date. Leave the recorder at home. <laughs> anyway, that was our first date. And then... Victory. Well, that was real love, though. Um, no ifs, ands, or buts. You performed in the theater, trained, really trained as an actor. Mm -hmm. 18 years. Trained as an actor, serious, actor studio, all that stuff. What was considered the most important kind of training you could have in, of that day. Worked in the theater, then you made films. Mm -hmm. So the Zero Must have, has that same kind of a career as well. Serious theater actor, legit theater actor, and then works in films. Richard Pryor is not a trained actor. He was a comic who became a movie star. Talk about the difference between working with those two types of people and what was it like to work with, with Richard? When he was good, he was very good and it was wonderful. When he was bad, he was horrid. But not on camera. But when he was on stuff that I didn't know about and would come 30 minutes late, 45, an hour, an hour and 15, an hour and a half late when we were in Arizona. Shooting. Shooting, yeah. Shooting what? Uh, that was stir crazy. Stir crazy. Mm -hmm. I loved him. And we were very close, but not socially. He had his own crowd. Uh, we didn't see each other except a few times at cast party and things like that. We would hug each other in the morning or at night, leaving. But when he was 
on whatever he was on uh, and coming late, he, he drove me crazy, but I thought if I start getting upset about that, with Zero, it's a completely different story. What was it like to work with Musto? When I met him, it was after he was blacklisted and went through hell and he wanted to paint more than he wanted to act. And he painted all the time. But when he met me, he had gone past being afraid of any authority or authority figures. He would talk to me during our lunch hour when the two of us were in the studio alone. He'd tell me about the blacklisting days and what he went through and what other people went through. But on camera, he was wonderful to me. When we went to a, my first press luncheon, there was Zero Mostel and Joe Levine who, and Dick Sean and some other people. And I was way off in the corner somewhere at another table because no one knew me. This was on the producers. And Zero came in, he looked at the cards, said Dick Sean, then he looked at mine and he took them and he switched places with them. So I was sitting next to him at the press luncheon. And he took care of me in that way all the way through the film. So it was just wonderful. And then yeah. what happens? Well, after I ate quickly, I said, I have a dentist appointment, I have to go. And, and I left. And actually, it wasn't a dentist appointment. It was because I was on unemployment, and I didn't want to miss my $55 a week. I couldn't afford to. So I left, and I got my $55. I've done that. Yeah. When I spoke to you off camera, you seemed, there was a point, I guess, or it was a part of a process where you grew weary of show business, and you grew weary of Hollywood. When did that start? I don't like show business, I realized. I like show, but I don't like the business. What about it? But the two go together. What about it, don't you like? You're in L.A., you're making you go to, movies, you're getting nominated, the movies are making money. When you go to a drugstore, a restaurant, a barber shop, all you hear is 8.5, 31.2. What are they saying? They're talking about percentages. He got this, he got that, that's, it'll cost you this. You can't get away from show business if you live in Hollywood. You just can't. When I say Hollywood, I mean Los Angeles. It's too important there. Yeah. Gilda used to say, it's a coal town, but instead of coal, it's music or movies or television. It's, but it's like a coal town. It's all, they're all there for that reason. Even my electrician in L.A. has his Director's Guild card. Unlike where we are now, here in Connecticut. It's mythical kingdom, the mythical kingdom. It's quiet tranquil, the woods are around, there isn't any show business. There's a theater, there's, mo there's a few movie theaters, but there are, there's one legitimate theater and a um, good Japanese restaurant. <laughs> what more do you need? I just want to finish by saying thank you from the bottom of my heart for doing this. And this is going to sound awkward maybe, but you know, you really are a treasure. You're a great, great, great treasure as a movie actor. I've enjoyed watching you in films more than I could really say, more than I could convey to you. And thank, thank you. you so much for doing this with me. Thank you. I, I want you to know that I, I don't think I would have done this if it hadn't been you who was going to do the interview. Thank I, you. I mean it. This being Turner, classic movies, I feel like I have to say, Gene, this is the beginning of a beautiful friendship. Thank you.